Welcome. This is the community room of the Flemington Free Public Library. And next door, you walked through MediaTek, which is the uh, place where the MediaTek Foundation has nine computers. And we are looking to expand. We Right now, MediaTek is basically for children who come after school and in the summers and the afternoon. And our my wish for MediaTek is to open it up to the community. And having this series is helping to spread the word about MediaTek and also do the things for Flemington that must be done, which is to put a new face on Flemington. Fun, arts, culture, and entertainment. And we're trying all of that tonight, all in one evening. And we continue for six evenings, the next five evenings in the summer. We'll have other speakers, so we'll keep you posted. Uh, you'll sign the email list. And now we'd like to present Ms. Lynn Benson, a longtime Flemington resident who is best known to me for uh, manning the Shaker Cafe and being the town center for Flemington for many, many years at the Shaker Cafe. Linda Benson, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, those ladies are a tough act to follow. I'm going to give it a shot. Um, what I'm going to do actually is read to you from a memoir that I started to write that was sort of cookbook memoir type thing. And it's about breakfast and my <coughs> obsession with breakfast. Mm -hmm. Breakfast is my favorite meal of the day. Sometimes I think about it before I fall asleep at night. What am I going to want in the morning? It's the only meal where I actually crave specific things, specifically and most often bacon. Perhaps breakfast is my favorite meal because bacon is in fact my favorite food. The complexity that is bacon is so real that even the most elitist gastronome cannot deny its essential beauty and versatility. It can be crispy or soft, salty or not, always smoky and delicious. And not unlike myself, adds quality and excitement to everything it comes in contact with. <laughs> <clears throat> my love for breakfast first blossomed in Vermont I think in the early spring of 1977. My dad bought, a, bought and renovated an old barn that sat atop 135 acres in southern Vermont, Stamford, Vermont to be precise. I remember that first visit to the place and I was thinking my dad was just a bag of nuts. It was full of cows and more disturbingly, cow poop. I mean, the land was beautiful, but my 13-year-old brain could not envision the wonderful, peaceful retreat that it would eventually become. And by the following winter, we were spending most weekends there, skiing, sledding, and essentially snuggling into the warmth of the wood-burning stove and an atmosphere of calm and tranquility. It was on those winter mornings that we'd venture out to breakfast. The raw chill in the air would sting my nose and ears as we made our way from the car to the door of what looked like a house. And when the door opened, the aroma that engulfed you was what I believe that heaven smells like every morning, a combination of bread and bacon, pancakes, eggs, coffee, muffins, and scrapple. Oh my. It wasn't just the smells that mesmerized me. It was everything. The sound of knives and forks dancing on plates, spoons tinking in the inside of coffee cups, the sizzle of something hitting a hot griddle, and a fleet of tiny grandmas running around with arms filled with plates, refilling coffee. I love those women. They reminded me of Oompa Loompas, all the way from their lacquered red hair to their white bib aprons. Although I think I would have loved anybody who put a hot cup of cocoa with whipped cream in front of me. Another thing I love about breakfast is that the flavor palette is so varied. It can be all things from sweet to savory. In fact, what's better than a well-spiced link of breakfast sausage dipped in sil silky maple syrup? I tend more toward eggs than pancakes, and a well-made omelet is a virtual lost art. Not those thin, griddle-cooked, rubber yellow slabs, but the fluffy, airy, golden pocket of joy filled with pretty much anything fresh, sauteed vegetables, smoked cheese, bacon, of course, <coughs> cooked in a six-inch pan. Later, when I owned my restaurant, I would test cooks, a cook's skill by asking them to cook an omelet for me. To me, the nuances needed to prepare a well-made omelet exemplify the skills needed to cook most things well. In my mind, to cook an omelet to perfection, there are certain things that are required. For home cooks, the best pan is a quality six-inch te Teflon pan. Any larger, and you use the fluffy nature that you're trying to achieve. 
Many restaurants use some kind of petroleum-based food release product, <laughs> really, uh, that tends to lend the food a metallic taste. But if that's your thing, go for it. I use butter, salted or not. Restaurants use these weird lubricants because they are cheaper and butter won't burn in them. Unless you're going to cook for the masses, butter should not be a problem, even for the most novice of cooks. Just don't wander off to do your laundry or walk the dog. If farm fresh eggs are available, snatch them up. You may be shocked by the t intense yellowness of them, but weirdly, that is how fresh eggs look. But store-bought eggs are fine. I buy cage-free, makes me feel good. Extra large eggs are my choice, but I'm a glutton. Pick what you like. In a bowl, crack three eggs and whip frantically with a fork or whisk. Some folks add milk or water, both purported to add um, airiness, but I don't. I achieve my airiness by whisking well, almost to a froth, and the technique during cooking. Put your pan on a high heat with butter in it. There's, this is where diligence is required. Do not let the butter burn. Stand at the stove. Don't stray. Don't get distracted. If you're new to this, focus. As the butter melts, watch it. Keep the pan over the flame. Slowly swirl the pan to have the butter evenly coat the bottom <coughs> and an inch or so of the sides of the pan. This will keep the eggs from sticking. When the butter begins to bubble slightly, pour the eggs in the pan. Now, move, now to move the eggs, I have used both a wooden spoon or a heated or heat-resistant rubber spatula. I think the latter works best. Um, I lost my place. <laughs> Um, oh, because it can conform to the shape of the pan. As the eggs begin to cook, you will see the outer edges release from the side of the pan. At this point, you'll begin to manipulate the eggs. This is where technique is needed, and with practice and failure, you will develop the skill. Holding the pan in your left hand, if you're a righty, and the spatula in your right, pull the eggs slowly from the outer edge toward the center while tilting the pan so that the uncooked eggs from the top pour down to the space that you've just created. Repeat this, moving all around, all around the omelet, until eventually no more egg will pour down. At this point, you will want to flip the omelet. Okay, so I'm a trained professional. I can air flip omelets like I was born to it. Later I'll talk about how to practice this method without screwing up a bunch of omelets. But for you, using a flat rubber, rubber spatula will work. Insert the edge of the spatula under the outer edge of the omelet, holding the pan as you do it. Gently slide the spatula till it's about halfway under the omelet and flip, kind of tossing the pan to help give it some lift. If all goes well with quick, accurate action, that baby will flip and no eggs will hit the floor or the cooktop. If, however, you are bent on learning the air toss method, which I think you should because it's just so much cooler, then here's, how, here's a little trick. Take your six inch pan and a piece of dry toast. It doesn't have to be hot. Put this in the pan. I'm going to read it because my description when I read it is better than actually saying it. Okay. Uh, cold piece of toast. Lay the piece of toast in the pan and just begin to toss. Now you don't want to just toss up. The object here is to flip. So if I break down the, the, into slow motion, holding the pan in your dominant hand, you're going to move it away from your body with a little jerk, bring it back. As, as you develop skill and speed, you will speed it up and get that omelet flipping like a Romanian gymnast. When you're, <laughs> when you're contented, incorporate fire, butter, and eggs. There we go. And that's my omelet flipping technique. <laughs> now, it's now in terms of technology, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a real tech head, but I, I do have an iPad, which somehow ends up in my bed every morning because I watch movies when I go to bed or play Scrabble boards with friends. Or, but in the kitchen, it, I use it in different ways. Clearly, you can go online and look at recipes. I have downloaded, you know, Epicurious, you know, for, for iPad. The other thing I like to do is I like to open my refrigerator door and stand there with my iPad and type in what's in there. That may not necessarily go together at all. But amazingly, there's always some weird combination of those things. You know, you know whenever you type in a keyword, it's, there's combinations. So I use it for that. I also use it, I do some catering. So I also use it to, to convert recipes for larger groups and things like that. Um, my Food Lover's Companion, which is this fantastic book, I don't know if any of you have it, which tells you what every possible food is, is a wonderful thing. But I gotta say, the internet is better. 
um, because it's got, you know, it's international, it's, you know, yeah. it's got everything. So. What's your favorite website for food? I use Epicurious a lot. Um, I have, you know, Alton Brown, I love him. I just think he's just such a food geek and, and I love the science behind it. So I use his recipes, I Google him a lot. Um, I, I pretty much, I look for good reviews. Um, go ahead. What website do you go on when you have random ingredients? In your I don't even go on the website. I just literally type it into the search, what's that thing called? Google. The Google machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just start typing the ingredients, you know, put a comma, and it, it they'll come up. Okay. All these different recipes will come up with those kinds of things, like put in ramen noodles and cabbage, and, you know, there's actually a great salad made from ramen noodles and cabbage. Um, but, I, yeah, I don't, uh, in terms of, I don't sous vide food, which I guess would be a, a technique that is kind of techy for chefs. I don't is use uh, any, what? sous vide is a, is a way of, um, you seal the, you seal the food in like a plastic and you, you sort of boil it under water. It's a new cooking technique that I'm, I'm not really, I'm more of a kind of old school cook. I don't really do a lot of that stuff. Um, and I don't use like hydrogen when I cook or anything like that. Except in the water. Yes, but I mean people, they use these things, freeze things and they use these spray things. And don't do people watch cooking shows? Yes. <laughs> America's Top, Top Chef? Yeah, yeah. Those they do all those crazy things. For future yeah, yeah. What about ingredients? Like, where, like, you know, do you have feelings about, like, do you just go to ShopRite and pick out your food? Yeah. I do. Do you want to one of these co op I've done that. We actually used to run a co op out of the basement of the Shaker. I've done that too. Right now, because it's just me, I do. I just go to ShopRite. Shop you know, and I, uh, I love to buy organic. I, it, I, it's expensive, but I do love to, to do that if I can. And clearly, I like to buy locally. The DeBoer market is fantastic. You have to get there early if you want tomatoes. Oh, sorry? You have to get there early if you want tomatoes. Oh, I'm sure. At this point, yeah. Um, the description of the omelet, mm -hmm. could you substitute margarine without You can. Any yeah, I'm not. I'm not personally a huge fan of the flavor of margarine, but you can. And I use olive oil if I don't have butter. Uh, I like olive oil actually quite a bit, depending on what kind of omelet I'm making. If I do like a, you know, peppers and uh, Parmesan omelet, I'll use olive oil for that. Uh, and you know, omelets, <clears throat> you can put anything in an omelet. <clears throat> you know, smoked salmon, cream cheese. You can, you know, anything that you can put between bread or anything you can put on a plate, you can put in an omelet. And then you can also season the eggs. You know, put. Uh, Thyme and eggs is really good. Thyme and cream cheese omelet is really good. There's all different kinds of omelets. Yeah, that's yeah. good. When do you actually put like your mushrooms and everything in there? Well, usually I prepare my vegetables and stuff in a separate pan. Okay. So when, when I flip the omelet, I lay the cheese. If I'm going to have cheese, I always put the cheese on the bottom and then put the hot vegetables on top of that and then fold it. Oh, and then you fold it. Mm -hmm. After you cook it? Yes, after I cook it. Yeah, it doesn't require, once it's, once the top is cooked, like I said, once you bend it and no more comes down, it's mostly cooked. And I usually just flip it and turn the heat off because the pan is so hot. And I don't like my omelets brown. I don't like them well done. I like my eggs medium. If that's so you're, weird. you're not folding in half. I, I am, once I fill it, I fold it and then pull it out of the pan. Okay. Yeah. After you flipped it. Yes, after you flipped it. Some people oh. don't do that. Some people don't flip it. And, and that's really fine. Again, it's, it, it's about how you like your omelet. If you like it kind of waterier on the inside, and some people do, you don't have to flip it because it'll pretty much be done. You know? and, and food continues to cook even when you turn the flame off. And something as delicate as an egg really doesn't require additional cooking once you flip it. What's your favorite omelet? Oh, gosh. <laughs> bacon? Did I say bacon? <laughs> Anything with bacon in it. I don't know. I mean, I love it. It's weird. I love I like cream cheese omelets. It's just something we used to serve it at our restaurant in New York, and I just cream cheese and herb omelet. I like salmon in an omelet. I don't know. I don't say you like bacon. I'm sorry? I said someone said you like bacon. I do like bacon. I think I have a Facebook page called, did you say bacon? <laughs> um, and actually, breakfast is my favorite meal to cook, not just to eat, but to cook. I just enjoy the speed of it. I like that you want your eggs over medium, and you want yours poached well, and you want yours scrambled soft, and you know, my bacon has to be crispy. And that irritates the daylights out of some cooks. But I like it, to me it's a challenge, and it's, you know, and when it's done right, it's very satisfying, you know. 
And I, I actually, Evelyn and I went to Milford. <coughs> Evelyn was my manager at the restaurant. We talked about opening another restaurant and we really wanted to do like a, we wanted to call it the kitchen table and every table would have its own theme. Like we'd have a 1950s table and a 1970s table and you know, do really great breakfast food. Because there's nothing better, you know? No, there's, there's nothing no. better. Fresh baked breads and, you know, fresh eggs and all that stuff is good. Mm -hmm. Pancakes. Yes, here. So Linda, if I learned to flip this omelet. Yes. Here, and I'm practicing with toast. Okay, it's, it's really easy. You just can, you can practice. That's brilliant. Um, then I can get the eggs not runny, but not the other part brown. I right. just fold it well, over, but then it gets too done, and, and I don't. Part, I quit using butter. Yeah, well, it okay. Well, part of what makes an olive brown is if you burn the butter. That's one thing. If <laughs> you burn the eggs, then it's going to be brown. You can use. They have you know, olive oil flavored Pam. That stuff is. I'll go with butter and flip. But it's you know it's not bad and it works. So and it, you won't burn your omelet if you don't you know if you turn it off as soon as you flip it over and let it sit in the hot pan. It's going to continue to cook. Nice. That will be firm. Yeah, I'm just thinking if you fold it, but then it cooks longer, you know, because it's sitting there. The other right. Part, you know, well, I don't fold it until I'm just ready to put so it on the plate. Yeah. Put it on. Okay. What's your uh, feeling, cast iron versus, um, you know, uh, nonstick? I like nonstick. Okay. I do. I just find it easier to deal with, especially I think for people at home, it's easier to deal with. Um, I do not like omelets cooked on a griddle on a flat top. When you go to a restaurant and they've made this thin thing and folded it over three yeah. times, and sometimes, this is the weirdest part, they put the filling on the top. What is that? Yeah, yeah. I do not like that. Uh, but I find, this is, this is my omelet pan, as you can see by the way it looks. Um, this is my favorite omelet pan. And they have smaller ones, but I don't see the point of that, because I'm not even going to make smaller than this. What if you're making an omelet for like three or four people? Yeah, that's what I was just Yeah, I would use a bigger, I would still use that kind of pan, but I would use a bigger pan. And then just yeah. cut it. As or I would make a frittata. That way you don't have to, you don't even have to flip that, that can go in an oven. So that's basically the same thing. And what I do then is I cook the filling in the pan, and then I whip the eggs up and pour them into the pan with the filling that's already in there, with the bacon, let's be honest, what we're talking about here, bacon and onions and cheese. And then you finish that, you do it sort of the same way you do an omelet, but then you finish it in the oven, and that way it'll puff itself up in the oven. And that's something some people like to put some milk into. But that for that, good. you can't use that pan. No. You yeah. use but for a regular omelet, you don't need to put it in the oven. When we had the when I had the restaurant, if we had something that needed extra melting, I would stick this in what we call the salamander, which is a it's a broiler. Okay. Usually, you see it in restaurants; it's on top of the stove. Mm -hmm. You kind of pull it out, stick this in, and you could stick this in with the handle sticking out, and I could melt what was that, whatever was in there. But you don't need to do that for omelet, especially if you put the cheese under your hot vegetables. It's all gonna melt. It's all gonna work. It's easy. It seems easy to me. What's in the future for Linda Benson? That's a very good question. I don't know. I, I do. I miss the restaurant. I miss. I miss my restaurant because it had the open kitchen and I had the ability to you know hang out with everybody and talk and it was fun and it was really you know sort of a family environment and over 20 years it really became a family environment. So will I ever do a restaurant again? I don't know. I don't know if I have it in me. You know, I opened the Shaker when I was 29, and I had a lot more energy then. And uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I. It's, it's, but you're catering. You're still. Catering. I have a catering company called Don't Platter Yourself. Oh, which I just do. What I do is I come to your house. If you're going to have a party, like 25 people, 30 people, I've done up to 50 people. I come to your house and prepare it at your house. So it's sort of like a personal chef service, but it's mainly just for parties. But. So I do do that, and that's fun. I enjoy that. It still gets me to cook. I, I'm, I'm at Grace UC Church, Church, Church over here okay. in the women's club, and so I cook for them sometimes on Sundays, and they're very appreciative. Oh, well, yes, we are. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. Can but, um, us, yeah. Can you tell us about the salt and pepper shaker collection? Well, it's still on display at the Shaker Cafe. That actually started, this is a silly story, my girlfriend and I, uh, my girlfriend and I used to call each other pigs. So we started giving each other pigs. And then she gave me a set of salt, pig salt and pepper shakers. And I was like, oh my god, these are so cute. And then my mother bought me a set of the pillow with a poodle sitting on it. And I was like, wow. And then everywhere I went, they're two dollars, you know, at a flea market. It's, if you're going to collect something, it's a great thing. And then, when I, had, I so I put them in the restaurant. I probably had 
you know, 500 sets at that point. So this is from the time that I'm 14 until 29. And then every time anybody went anywhere, they would bring me a set. You know, I had Bali salt and pepper shakers, and you know, I had some. There, there's. I hope. I hope they're still all there, but they're still on display at the shaker. It was fun to collect, but I'm not. A, I'm not. I don't want to dust them. Let's <laughs> be honest. Did people ever think that you were part of the shaker? Oh yeah, yeah. And what, what, and it, like, did people come in and say? Yeah, uh, well, they would just be like, well, uh, what shaker food do you have? And they'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> like, they expected to see the chairs hanging on the walls, and I don't know what everybody expected, but it, and, and it was funny because the logo had the picture of the salt and pepper shakers on it, so I was like, I don't know. We were just in Aruba a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and someone recommended a tapas restaurant to us. Oh really? Salt and, uh, salt and pepper shakers all over the wall. That's great. And I told my family that you have to go inside and look. It's just like the That's shaker great. Cafe. Yeah. I mean, it was a fun thing to do, and it, it, I always loved it when people would bring me stuff. And there are some that I, you know, feel sad I left behind, you know. But again, I don't. We, want we could get them if you. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes people cool. say that, or people say to me, "What happened to those salt and pepper shakers I gave you?" I'm like, I think they're still on the shelf. Maybe some of us could come to your house and you could show us a little more detail. Sure. Do we have a kitchen here? Yeah, sure. We, we'll, there's a kitchen here? We'll yeah. get some bacon. Okay. Yeah, we have it. There's a, that's a kitchen. There's there you go. Oh, I don't know if I can microwave an omelet. You try. No. I don't like I'm sure you could. <laughs> Any other questions? Linda, do, dare I bring up the topic of hash browns? We, uh, we didn't do hash browns there, Warren. We did home fries. Well, well let's talk There's about that. Oh, did you, did you <laughs> have an issue with that at the shaker? No, I just want. I, it, look, can, What's the let difference? Me, let me let me back out. Yeah. P potatoes. Yes. In breakfast. Okay. I can talk potatoes. Work with that. Well, I mean, I you know I love potatoes, and I always like toy with this no carb lifestyle, but it just really isn't fun. So I, <laughs> the potatoes that we made at the shaker were uh, they were new potatoes. We left the skin on. We sautéed onions, garlic, parsley, salt, and pepper. Mm. Tossed the potatoes yes. in there, and then we would put them on the grill and put the weight on them so they get nice and crispy. I thought that they were great. They were delicious. And uh, I, we never went in for hash browns. I think only because of the labor intensiveness of them. I'm sorry, I said hash browns. Is that it's okay? Is it's the okay. weight is that the key? The weight the the weight just kind of flat smashes it all down, so it almost becomes like a potato cake. But they're individual pieces anyway, so they're kind of crisped on all sizes, all sides. It's just, it just I don't know why I came up with that. I think it was. Would you use butter as well with that, or would you use? We use oils. We use canola oil on the grill. Yeah, butter butter burns too much, and then your grill ends up turning black, and then your pancakes are black, and your you know whatever you cook on the grill is going to be black. So you have to use. Canola so is oil it green on. peppers and onions, or just onions, or what? Um, sautéed onions, garlic. Fresh parsley, salt, and pepper. Oh. And what we would do is boil the potatoes so they were just about soft. And then we would saute all that stuff and so toss you boil them together. Yeah. Boil them yeah. for how long? Just till they're soft. You don't want them real well done because then they're just going to disintegrate. So I just, sorry, stick a fork in it. If the fork goes in and out easily, you take it boil out. Boil them before you cut them? No, we cut them first. But we were doing, you know, giant pots full. So you could do it either way. You know, it's for us. It was just easier to get them cut first, and then you know, then do it later. I was always under the impression that olive oil burns at high heat, and I it does. Ones that you had to use if you were going to do a special one called spectrum. Uh, well, olive oil burns at a higher heat than butter, but we didn't use olive oil. We used canola oil on the grill, and our grill wasn't real hot. Not, like different areas. When you have it, we had a six-foot griddle. So when you have different areas, you have to keep different areas at different temperatures because you're not going to cook. You know, something like bacon that you want to sizzle and get really hot at the same temperature that you're going to put pancakes on. You want it to be a little bit lower, so they cook slower and more evenly. So, you know, depending on what we used and what we were making, we used, when I would, I would basically use that thing as a grill, as a saute pan, like on Friday night when we would do um, Mexican night and I had to cook up 20 pounds of peppers, I would just slather that thing with butter and dump all these peppers in and just like toss it around like a you know, Benny Hanna chef. And that's, I use it like a saute pan in that situation. And, and I would use oil or butter depending on what I was making. It, you know, for me, I love butter. And I love olive oil because I'm Italian. But they're different things. I mean, I wouldn't, 
you know, like I said, if you're going to do an Italian style omelet, I would recommend using olive oil because then you do have that little hint of olive oil, you know, or even drizzling a little of it inside the omelet at the end, especially if it's like infused with some herbs or something, because then it really keeps its flavor. Now, since you lived in Vermont, any any special specialties did you do with uh, maple syrup? You know, I was a kid. I didn't really. Uh, we, we it was like a ski house for us. But maple syrup, not really. I mean, I like to dip sausage in maple syrup. That's my specialty. Linda, <laughs> how do you get pancakes to be cooked inside? This is patience. I, but and temperature. I mean, what, what so, if, you, if your pan is too hot, what's going to happen is the outside's going to cook. Right. And you're going to go, oh, that's done. And you're going to flip it over. And then the outside is going to cook on the other side. Right. But the inside will not have been done. What you need to do is watch for those, watch for the bubbles. You know the bubbles that come, come up on pancakes? Yes. Keep your flame maybe a little bit lower. Right. And watch for the bubbles. And when the bubbles are pretty consistent and even around the entire thing, and you're not burning the bottom because you're keeping the bottom, the heat low. Okay. When the bubbles are kind of even, that's when you're going to flip it. Because when the, you know that's when the heat's getting into it, and then you're going to finish it. Flip on the other it, side. and then and then how do you know when the other side's done? You look at it. You look at it. <laughs> My husband, I'm like, how many minutes until he's like? Or well, you cut you into it, at. like Chef Ramsay. It's raw. <laughs> <laughs> Ginger. Uh, you, you talk about how to make this omelet, but you must have trained. The, the people that worked at the shaker because yes. you didn't work you didn't make every omelet that we had on no. Sunday morning. Yeah, no. And yeah. They, they were they great. did a great I mean, job. They were excellent. They yeah. were they were great. They were great because you could teach them something once and they got it. They were really very good. Yeah. I was it was I had a great staff there and I had staff that my manager worked for me for seventeen years. Dawn worked for me for ten years. I mean I I was you know, a lot of restaurants people were really transient, but we really had a family bond there. And I think that had to do with the fact that we were in constant contact with the customers, and they were in constant contact with the cooks, and the you know everybody knew everybody, and I just think it was a very special, special group, and I love them, so teaching them was a pleasure, you know, and I'm and I'm happy to say that hopefully that they can go on in their lives and they'll have that skill, and you know that'll be something, and it's not just you know you're a short order cook, they have some skill, mm -hmm. some real skill, so that makes me really happy. That's important. Yeah, and the Shaker family sort of you know ones in Sweden. Dawn has opened two stores in Frenchtown now. I mean, it's everybody's kind of got something going on, so it's really great. It was great. What possessed you to put the uh, presidents in their underwear on a table? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that was the <laughs> What time of the day? Oh, they were the paper dolls, yeah. That was my, my husband, my then husband, Bob, and I, we had so much fun doing those tables. It was like anything we could find. We're like, let's have a glue it to the table. So we found this, um, the presidential paper dolls, but they were all in their gitchies. So we had like um, Bill Clinton and Hillary, and she had a bra and slip on. Yeah. So the yeah. tables were all covered. They were all different themes. We had a backgammon table. We had a uh, sign language, right? Sign language yeah. table. Um, all the tables had a different theme, so you'd have something to do while you're sitting there. It was interesting bringing my daughters in as preschoolers to explaining that that's George it's Bush in his underwear. <laughs> irreverence about the shaker that I think people yes. enjoyed. I reflect. If you were preparing a breakfast for someone and you wanted it to be a surprise, what would be something that they wouldn't think of for breakfast? Hmm. Cat food. <laughs> Bob, no, not cat food. <laughs> not even at all. I, you know, I, it, depends, like, it, you know, it depends on what they're used to. I mean, uh, what would surprise me? Surprise or delight me? I uh, delight. I think I'd like to be delighted yeah. better than surprised. Yeah. I, you know, I think oh, like anything. We we're t I don't know. We were talking to the, oh the girls, the, the lovely singers. Um, we're talking about their friend going to the culinary institute. If somebody were to make me a fresh croissant and mm -hmm. bring it to me, that would delight me. That would delight me. What would you do with like salmon to delight some? I'd probably make an omelet out of it. I just like it in an omelet. It's some red onions, some cream chopped. cheese. Um, I like to chop it. I like it to be easy. I don't like you to have to take a bite and pull out a whole giant uh, something. You mean like lox you know? or cooked smoked, smoked salmon? Smoked salmon, no. no. Like lox. Lox. Yeah. Yeah, that's delicious. Yeah. And even, and even in that, like normally I would cook onions. In that, I might even just finely dice them and put them in raw to see how that mm. little oh. crunchiness to it started with good pumpernickel bread. Mm. That sounds good, right? It it's, it's working. Uh, I like steak and eggs. 
I make steak and eggs for myself for dinner. Steak and eggs. Steak and eggs. I use a ribeye. I'm like I said, I'm Italian. I like fat in my meat, so I would use a ribeye. Should we pass um, the cupcakes like, around? I like, uh, <laughs> I like to poach an egg on, on a steak. I put butter on my steak, too. I know this is horrible, oh. but it's so good. What about burger meat? That's, I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't work for me. Maybe a taco omelet might be good. Um, we used to make like cheeseburger soup. That sounds crazy, but that's true. That's not crazy. <laughs> really good. Your soups, um, you, you used to do a lot of very interesting things I with soups. Soup. That's, that's and beans. Like and, um, yeah. and there were there were always vegetarian options. Yeah, um, yeah that's soup, soups, uh, in terms of like my favorite dish to make, even for myself. I love to make soup. I love I love the fact that it'll never be the same twice, and that you can make it out of whatever you have, and you can feed masses with it, and it's and people are comforted by it, and all you need is some good bread and some soup. What are some of your favorite soups? I like chicken tortilla soup. I like um, um, escarole and white bean soup with smoked sausage in it. I like um, spinach and egg drop. We used to have that at the restaurant all the time. Stracciatella, that's called. Yeah, it's good stuff. Where did you do your training, and what's your? I'm not. Cool, I'm not trained in the culinary school. When I was, um, well, my first restaurant job was at Baskin Robbins. <laughs> so that's that. Yeah. That's my Italian. My ice cream training. Your heritage. What, uh, my, I'm half Italian and half. I call my mom Euro trash. I don't know how she feels about that, but that's what she is. Uh, and so, therefore, am I. Um, my parents bought a restaurant in New York when I was about 16 years old. So, Which restaurant? Uh, it was called the Honey Tree. It was a real kind of neighborhood joint. It was on the corner of 3rd Avenue and 20th Street, right around the corner from Gramercy Park. Okay. And um, uh, so I started working there in my, in my summers. And you know, I was, I'd say I was trained by a 200 pound Puerto Rican named Speedy Gonzalez, because that's what it was. And he was a very cool man. We used to go jet skiing in the Long Island Sound together, oh which does not taste good. Um, the Long Island Sound, that is. Um, so I learned, you know, I, I did everything. I did salad girl sandwiches and kind of worked my way up there. And then, um, you know, I was a theater major, so therefore I was a waitress and worked in restaurants after after my parents sold theirs. And then they sold theirs probably, probably when I was probably 22. And I managed a couple of restaurants. I managed a place called Great Taste in Princeton, which is no longer there. And then I worked for the guy that opened Mother's, Joey Lucaro at Lucaro's in New Hope. And then I realized that um, I didn't like taking orders from other people. So I opened my own restaurant. So I did. I opened the Shaker in 1991. And it was good. And did you name it for I did. You know what? I had all these salt and pepper shakers, and I was yeah. like, Oh my God! Finally, a place to put them. Mm -hmm. You know, so okay, that's a good thing for a restaurant. And, and mainly, we were—it was small. We had 30, I think, total of 30 some seats, and it was really a sandwich shop. We just did breakfast and lunch in the beginning, and then we—I I met this crazy woman named Angela, and she uh, was married to a Mexican gentleman, and she was a phenomenal cook. And she suggested, you know, why don't we try doing Mexican night on Friday nights? And so she came in and helped me and taught me everything I knew about Mexican mm -hmm. food, and uh, that became, you know, as they can tell you that became a very popular evening, and that was that was I think a phenomenon in itself because you know you guys would come with a group and you knew this group and that group knew this group and everybody knew each other and it was just it was like a big old party every Friday. In fact, I think we did some mamba dancing out in the streets a couple times. And then when we, the, my favorite story of the Shaker is when we moved the restaurant, and so I I my lease sort of had become in dispute. And so I, I felt very uncomfortable about being there. I felt very, very vulnerable. So I decided that I was gonna look for another location and the Bagel Smith had closed. And so we, we went in there and, and what had happened was the owner, it had become like the courthouse coffee shop or something like that. And the people had completely gutted it, literally taking the ceiling down, the acoustic ceiling down, everything was gone. It was just this big scary open space. And so we decided that we were gonna move there. And I had the, um, architect, actually an architect here in town, I can't remember his name, sort of, I wanted him to design it so that it echoed a familiarity for people in terms of when you came in, you know, the counter was the sort of in the same-ish location and it was going to be much bigger, but I wanted it to sort of feel comfortable to my customers because they were freaking out. They're like, you can't, it's going to be different, it's not going to be the same, we're going to hate it, you know. And so therefore I was freaking out. I actually went to therapy and I think I got some well at that time. <laughs> so, so the very last night of the Shaker was a was a Friday night, and 
we had all these people in there. Everybody was like, you know, teary eyed, and you know, somebody bought a, brought a blender, and we were making margaritas. And so at one point, I was like, all right, that's it. Everybody, get up, rip something off the wall, and we're gonna carry it down the street. And we did this. Somebody had a boom box. We paraded down Main Street with like I had that mounted rhino head. <laughs> Somebody's carrying that, you know, like people are just carrying like crazy clocks. I and mean, I have all this tacky, really tacky decor. And there's people sitting on the Union Hotel front porch, and they're like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "We're moving!" And we just brought everything in. I said, "Put it down somewhere." We turned on the lights, put the music on, and started making margaritas. And I was like, "That's it." Right. You know, it was great. And they were, you know, these were customers that had been coming to me from the time that I opened. So it was, you know, and it was not like family. It was wonderful. It was a good experience. And nobody really freaked out when we moved. It worked out pretty well, I think. Worked out better. Yeah. 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 yeah it did. It was. A, it was a good location. Yeah. Anything else? Oh yes, yes, here. If it's possible, uh, besides a frittata, is there any way? Is there any way if you have a lot of people for brunch that you can have eggs? I mean, I've yeah, read I mean, scrambled eggs. They say you can make them and they don't get. Do you know what a strata is? That's, I love no. making strata for a party. Don't. That's this is a great way to use leftover things. It's it's you can take sliced stale Italian bread, slice it up. Um, you lay it in the bottom of a casserole dish, okay, and then you put. Again, whatever you like. I, if you if you have meat people in the crowd, smoked sausage is always good. Uh, roasted peppers are always good. Caramelized onions are always good. Mm -hmm. Sharp cheddar or Monterey Jack cheese. And you lay all that on there. And it, I mean, this is going to be another egg dish. And I, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of other things you can make. But then you whip up your eggs. And then I forget the ratio of milk to eggs. You add some milk into it. First, let me go back. You want to put butter or something in the pan mm -hmm. before you put all this in there. And then you pour the eggs over this mixture of bread and vegetables and meats, literally whatever you want. You can do it Greek with feta and spinach. You can do it however you want. And then you bake it in the oven. And you slice it like a lasagna. And it's delicious. And you can serve at room temperature. It's great. So it's like quiche. Yeah, it's like a quiche. But there's something about the bread. I mean, I like the, the bread. And I've done it even with croutons, leftover croutons. You know, you can do it that way as well. And you can do it with pasta. How long do you cook it? Till it's done. <laughs> so you stick a bulk in it and it comes out clean? I don't know. Like, you know, depending on, it depends on the size of the pan. You know, if you're doing a big thing, it's going to take you an hour. If you're doing a small one, yeah, probably like a half hour or less, maybe 20 minutes or 350. I, you know, I'm so used to cooking everything in a sheet. You, know, you should see, like, I made myself a, a, a Greek uh, brown rice salad the other day. I must have had 10 cups of it. I'm like, okay, I had to bring it to people. I can't cook small. That's why I like a steak and an egg. Now, with the, with the sausage in mm -hmm. there, you have to cook that first? Well, I use smoked sausage, like kielbasa, so it's cooked. Okay. You know, or, right. you know, or actually now they have these packaged sort of, um, this, I don't know if this sounds weird to people, but chicken sausage, which I like. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they have the kind of feta one, or they have right. the ones with the different seasoning, and they're already cooked. I do like to toss them in a pan just to crisp them up yeah. a little bit, because I don't okay. like that sort of Mushy. spongy yeah. texture that they sometimes have. But. Did you have a question? Yes. I did. Um, I like cottage cheese a mm -hmm. lot, and I somewhere once had cottage cheese omelet, and I sure. tried to duplicate it, and I wasn't able to. Is there some secret? I don't. I've never made a cottage cheese omelet, but I, I, I maybe you need to dry the cottage cheese out with like a uh, cheesecloth or something. Uh, I don't know. Um, I wasn't able to do yeah. it. Yeah. Maybe that's why. That you know, yeah. I would. I would recommend putting in a cheesecloth and kind of squeezing it to get some of the liquid out of it. Um, you were to ask, did you specifically want to know about non-egg dishes for breakfast? No, 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 oh, egg okay. dishes. Okay. Because, yeah. yeah, yeah, no. Okay. What, what I really want to know yes. is, I remember one night you said, oh. and I, no, maybe I ran into you at the shop, right? Um, whatever, it was lamb. And you said, I got a hankering for oh, lamb. Yeah, yeah. You ran around in there, and, and what am I going to do with it? And the way you're talking about, uh, you know, lie in bed thinking about what you're going to have for right, breakfast. Right. Are you always like that? Have you always been that way? I'm very susceptible to, uh, especially with food concerns, suggestions. So if you run into me and you say, I just had sushi, I'm like, sushi, sushi, I got to have sushi, I got sushi. <laughs> or somebody will say, oh my god, we had the best steaks last night. I'm like, steak, I need a steak. I'm just very, I'm very susceptible. It's a weird thing. I don't really understand it. So I think somebody said lamb, and I've never cooked lamb. I never cooked lamb for myself before. I never cooked lamb at the restaurant because I always like to keep my price point pretty low, so we just right. didn't do that. Um, so I had to like, uh, what do they call it? I forget the technique. 
where you make the lollipops out of it. Yeah. You're a great French. Thank you. I was thinking that as kissing, but it works for lamb. Yeah. So you would basically you clean the bones, so you have this perfect, beautiful little lollipop of lamb. Wow. And I found this is one of those instances where I went online and I just googled. I knew what I wanted to use. I wanted to use herbs, and I wanted to use breadcrumbs. So I put in lamb, you know, herb breadcrumb, and I found this fabulous, simple, pan-fried, you know, lamb recipe, and I blew my mind. <laughs> 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 you blew your mind. You thought, I am great. Oh my gosh, this is there it is. I am so amazing. <laughs> you rock. <laughs> I do, actually. I take pictures of it and put it on Facebook. And I'm like, I rock. 